Hello, kings, queens, nerds, and geeks. Powder Milk here, and welcome back to Fallout Equestria. Now we're in chapter 33. Hold on, let me uh, figure out which chapter this one is. Uh, this is chapter 33, Crusaders. Now, I'm going to take a quick guess. This is going to involve the Cutie Mark Crusaders. And if it is, this is going to be a very interesting chapter. And plus, guys, we're very, getting very close to chapters that are going to extend in multiple videos. So, I might actually be doing extremely long episodes or just do separate episodes for those chapters. But either way, we're going to get through those chapters. <clears throat> Let's make this series very long. Well, luckily, this chapter is about only an hour long, so... It's uh, about it's a bit shorter than the other chapters, so let's get uh, get on with it, shall we? I'm very curious because where we left off was um, little Pip had erased her memories and put them in the memory orbs, and she was making a plan so the goddess doesn't read her mind or whatever. And apparently, there's some bit of social issues going on. Apparently, little Pip accidentally got. Uh, Velvet Remedy and Calamity together as a couple. And let's see. Hmm. Oh yeah, there was that council that was in Trinity uh, in, in Trinity Tower. And what else? Oh yeah, and um uh, Red um uh, Red Eye it, I was uh had retreated his forces for some reason that we do not know yet. Though you guys all probably already know, I don't know, but I got to find out. So Let's get on with it. Rain. What had once started off as a light drizzle in the morning was a gusty downpour by early afternoon with ambitions towards a brutal deluge by the evening. The Manhattan ruins matched the clouds above in a montage of gray on gray, made hazy by a screen of precipitation. Raindrops bombed the puddles on the roof of Tamponi Tower, swelling them until their edges pushed together, kissing and coupling into miniature lakes. Zenith's hooves splashed through them as she carried the last of our supplies across to the Sky Bandit. I watched as she rose up to her hind hooves and passed the bag to Calamity, who stored it inside. My gaze lingered on her, taking in the stripes that covered her back, rippling a little as the muscles beneath her coat moved. I had to agree with homage. I liked her better this way. As pleased as I was to give her the opportunity to shop and mingle amongst the ponies of Ten Pony Tower, I was happy to see her stripes again. Removing the dye had been a little more difficult than I had anticipated. It would have taken weeks for her coat to resume its color naturally, or multiple herbal baths that would have depleted supplies Zenith insisted were best kept for other uses. So we sought out Life Bloom, hoping he might know a spell that would remove the false coloring. Fortunately, he did, and offered to teach it to us with a small fee. Velvet Remedy jumped at the opportunity. She was certain that the spell should fall within the boundaries of her magical prowess. Hmm. Cosmetic magic was at least tangentially tied to the medical and entertainment spells that came naturally to her, after all. I recalled how easily she had cleaned the Sky Bandit with her magic once. I expected this to be even easier. But while Velvet was capable of casting the spell, it proved surprisingly taxing for her and yielded somewhat limited effects. The dye had faded only enough to turn Zenith's once white coat into a muddy gray. I give it my best effort, but in vain. My horn would not even deen a glow as I poured my concentration into the spell. In the end, we had to pay Life Bloom to cast it himself. You are staring at her ass, aren't you? Homage whispered into my ear, startling me just as my gaze had slid down to linger on Zenith's rear. My ears shot up in alarm, and I felt myself blushing as I stammered. Wait, what? No, no, I was just... Oh my god, plotting. call me act again, Pip. That's it. With the plan and the plots and the things. Homage chuckled. Sure you were. Adopting a musing tone, the gray unicorn teased softly. Next time, I'll try to give you those instructions you wanted. I blushed harder, thankful that she wasn't speaking loudly enough for my friends to hear. Well then. Although, I'm not sure how. You're such a delightfully sensitive thing when I demonstrate on you. You would have a hard time focusing on the lesson. Luna's mercy. My ears were burning. <laughs> and I'll admit, it would be difficult for me to concentrate as well. Amage leaned close and whispered into my ear. Maybe bringing in a third party would be in order. Zenith, perhaps. Why? I felt myself splash into a puddle before I realized my legs had gone out from under me. 
The rooftop water was cold and soaked beneath my armor, getting trapped against my coat and skin. Amage giggled. She was joking, of course. She had to be. As I picked myself up, my mind had already dug out half a dozen reasons why a threesome with Zenith would be out of the question, not the least of which being that the striped mare didn't like to be touched. But the little gray unicorn had planted the seeds of a fantasy in my head now, knowing it would not make my time away from her any easier. Oh my god. I shot homage an annoyed glare, deciding this was probably her revenge for my having responded to one of her favorite toys with a lack of enthusiasm. You're just a bit evil, I hissed. You know that, right? What's this? I asked as Velvet Remini floated some sort of railing onto the roof of the Sky Bandit. Luggage rack. Sorta. Calamity said as he landed on top of the rain-slicked passenger wagon and began to tug straps tight. I figure the way Steelhoofs took on that star spawn thing while standing on the roof worked out mighty good. Setting up a mountain position for a pony to ride topside even if I need to do some fancy maneuvering. As Calamity pulled a little welder out of his saddlebags, the reward, I assumed, of recent bartering, Velvet Remedy primly added, It can also carry the luggage. Putting the welder down and checking his work, Calamity suggested, I reckon it wouldn't hurt to put some arm on her too. It'd slow us down and I'd have to take more breaks more often, but some ablated plates would make her a whole lot safer. I got the feeling Calamity was expecting a fight I didn't know was coming. Was this part of the plan to deal with the goddess? Something I had made sure I wouldn't be aware of? Or maybe this had to do with his new concerns regarding the Enclave? If it was the former, we would be better off if I didn't ask him about it. Pressing the issue would leave him in an uncomfortable position of having to lie to me. Worse, I could cause him to slip and give away something important. I would just have to trust him. My thoughts flicked Good back job, to the memory you orbs I had viewed yesterday. Control. According to Calamity, I had told him it was safe for me to view them. Had I known about them, I would have been driven to distraction by curiosity. But I had not even been aware of them until Calamity had set them on the table and sent them rolling towards me. Now I wondered if this was just a gift to myself, or if there was some piece of information in the orbs I felt I needed to know. The first orb held a wealth of information. Two elements stood out amongst the others, the first being the vision of the Black Book. Clearly, the Black Book was itself a soul jar. At first, I wondered if Rarity had made it one, but I dismissed the idea quickly. Far more likely it had been infused with the soul of the mad zebra alchemist who had written it. If the zebras feared and loathed everything they associated with the stars, and the Black Book was supposedly dictated to that mad zebra in dreams, this explained how the book could have survived destruction for generations on zebra lands before finding its way here. And that would certainly have enhanced and given credence to the darkest legends that formed around it. Furthermore, I recalled that soul jars could have other magic hung on them. Who knew what mystical effects the Black Book might be asserting over any pony in its vicinity? The other aspect of the orb which stood out to me was the conversation between Rainbow Dash and those three bucks. In that argument, I had witnessed the beginnings of the Enclave. The orb spoke to a spreading sentiment among the Pegasus ponies, a resentment of their sacrifices in a war they believed themselves literally above, that had reached the heart of at least one Pegasus in a position of power, one who would be killed as the first zebra megaspell annihilated Cloudsdale. And with it, an acknowledgement that Rainbow Dash, heroine of the war, leader of the Shadow Bolts, had become a driving force behind the Pegasi's escalating involvement in the fighting. I recalled a news article in the Philadelphia Ministry of Image Hub, in response to the zebra's recruitment of dragons. Luna intended to strengthen Equestria's Pegasi forces. Rainbow Dash's new magically powered armor, I suspected, was at least one part of that. Rainbow Dash had become an icon of Pegasi participation, both to those who supported it and those who had grown to despise it. The Dashites were an almost foregone conclusion. The isolationist core of the Enclave was at odds with Calamity's worries. Unless... Unless they threatened the gardens of Equestria. Icy fear shot through my body at the idea. But if that was true, surely that wasn't something I'd want to forget. I'd need to act on it immediately. No pony would keep me from joining Spike in defense of his cave, least of all myself. The second orb had been deeply bittersweet in experience. I felt such happiness and sadness at seeing five of the mares I'd grown to know and love in a warmer and happier time. A spring before the summer of war that would bring such heartache and horror to all of them. They had stood on the precipice of something terrible, and they had loved and laughed and danced. The memory, 
to the best I could see, was of no strategic value. Hmm. This was not the first I had heard of their mission to the buffalo, although now I had much more context. Instead, this was a vision into the beauty of the past, a reminder of what ponies had once been, and what I prayed could, would, one day be again. Prayer alone is not enough, I murmured to myself. No, for our world to change, there had to be action. There had to be ponies who would stand up against the darkness and stare it down. I would be such a pony. Hmm, Amage said, standing next to me again. I was so soaked by the rain now that the discomfort from the puddle earlier had been forgotten. You look lost in thought so deep you could be in a memory orb. I grimaced. I reached into my saddlebags and floated out the ditzy do orb, passing it to Amage. Oh yeah, ditzy do. I, I forgot. This, I told her. You've been my voice in the darkness more than once. If things ever get too bleak for you to find your way to hope, watch this. Let her be your guide back. Amage cocked her head curiously. With half-lidded eyes, she whispered, I won't need it. You are my guide. But she slipped a telekinetic blanket of her own around the gift, taking it away. I would fight to make that bright and innocent past our future once again, I said, turning to her. Even if it means dashing myself against the evil and cruelty of this wasteland until there's nothing left of me. Like the ponies who cracked and shattered their hooves pounding at the sealed door of Stable 2, I would persevere, making Equestria a better place one battle at a time, until there's nothing left for me to give. And then, when I'm too broken to go on, I'll float my dying body right down the throat of darkness and make it choke on me. Homage gave me a sad, knowing look, then leaned forward and nuzzled my cheek softly. Forcing a smile, I chuckled. Or, you know, this could all end in sunshine and rainbows. No need to get pessimistic. Amage laughed, despite the tears that had begun to well in her eyes. Or maybe that was just the rain. Speaking of orbs, I said, changing the subject. Amage blinked in the rain and smiled wanly. Got it. If they want to see your memories in order to get to know you, then they need to have as much context as possible. So anyone viewing them is required to watch them in order, starting with the first. Perfect, I replied, now wearing a more genuine smile. Although, I prefer we kept orb number eight to ourselves, Armage added, and for the first time, I saw her blush. <laughs> so would I, I admitted dourly. But at the time I figured that denying them one of the orbs would undermine the notion that I have nothing to hide from them. Sadly, I still think so. Homage nodded. Indeed it would. Her gaze shied off to the side. Maybe I can persuade them it isn't necessary. At least after the first pony sees it. Knowing what she could do to me, I doubted any pony would pass up the opportunity to experience that. The thought of people enjoying Homage's attentions meant only for me, as me, felt slimy. It was a violation that made me sick inside. This was not a sacrifice I wanted to make. But knowing how much good the secrets locked away inside the hidden chambers of Ten Pony Tower could do for all of Equestria, the pony in my heart demanded it. Can I ask why? Amish questioned. I blinked. She had to know why I was willing to let the Twilight Society into my memories. Seeing my confusion, she clarified. Oh, I caught that smile. You are planning something. Why the instructions, if it's not just context? Oh. I bit back a snicker. Well, it's just that those memories cover, what, two days? And it takes as long to view a memory as the events themselves. And unlike when I live them, those ponies will have to take breaks. Stop, eat, sleep, do whatever work those ponies do. I shrugged. I figure, if we're lucky, by the time they get to more telling orbs, everything will all be over. And if not, well, at least I'll have forced the whole bunch of hoity-toity ponies in Ten Pony Tower to eat zebra cooking and like it. Homage broke into a laugh. The mare threw her arms around me, hugging me so fiercely we both fell into the small lake that had formed on the roof. I splashed her. She splashed back. The two of us lay there in the cold, pooling water, kicking waves and sprays at each other until I could swear we were wetter than the rain was. Give up, she squealed. 
Absolutely not. You didn't want to even hide. You're making that one subtle. Come on, that, that innuendo wasn't even subtle. My finishing move was to telekinetically grasp about a barrel full of the water, hovering it over her head. I pointed up with a hoof and got a most delightful squeak out of her before dropping the deluge onto my homage. Okay, okay, I'll give up, she cried out. Slowly, we both got to our hooves. Homage was shivering, dripping, and her blue hair hanging straight down like a wet curtain. She was impossibly beautiful right then. Ready to go? Velvet's voice called out kindly from the Sky Bandit. I turned to see that Calamity had finished attaching the mounting on the passenger wagon's roof and was already harnessing himself to the front. I looked back to Homage. I've got to go. I smiled. Excuse me. But you'll never be far. I'll be tuned in, listening to your message of hope. I gave her horn a soft kiss. DJ Pony. The somber mood of our former conversation seeped back, making my sopping coat Excuse feel me? all the chillier. Promise me you'll come back. She didn't even need to ask. I pinky pie swear. The sky bandit cut through the heavy mid-afternoon downpour. Calamity was getting a miserable drenching, but he had hoofed waved off Velvet Remedy's offer of a protective shield, claiming he was already as wet as he was going to get after attaching the new roof mounting. The claim was half bravado and half being just plain wrong. Now, while he was saying nothing, I could tell he was regretting it. Not that any of the rest of us weren't dripping wet. The passenger wagon with its broken windows provided only cursory protection from the elements. Soon, all the benches were soaked and the metal floor ran with rivulets of water. The tarps covering our gear kept our supplies partially dry, but water was seeping underneath to soak the bottoms of packs and bags. Pyrelite kept giving us miserable, mewling hoots. Velvet Remedy had tried using her cleaning spell to dry us over and over, but it had been an uphill battle, and after an hour she gave up. Velvet and I were huddled together on some benches in the back of the passenger wagon. Velvet's horn glowed, and a soft melody seemed to pour out of it. More like that, she asked me. All I could do was nod, feeling a little stunned. Did you just come up with that right now? I asked timidly, amazed once again by how easily she could create entirely new music and have it be so utterly beautiful. Well, yes, but I've had years of practice, Velvet Remedy admitted. And it is one of my natural talents. Giving me a motherly look, she advised, Before I can create the music for your song, little Pip, you should really come up with some lyrics, at least enough for me to know the rhythm and the meter you wish to use. I gave a deep sigh. The idea had sounded so good in my heart last night, and so easy in my head this morning. I wanted to create a song that expressed my feelings for homage. Not something sappy, but an honest, earnest outpouring of my heart. Something that I could have Velvet Remedy perform the next time we went to Ten Pony Tower as a special gift for the disc jockey pony who had let me fall in love with her. Well then... With Velvet Remedy on my side, I had thought I could have something at least halfway decent by the time we reached Table 29. But... I'm no good at lyrics. Coming up with words is just... I sighed. It's really hard. Let me help, Velvet suggested listening to what I had so far and politely trying not to wince. Within a few hours, Velvet and I had put together a few passable lines, stringing them together into what could be a full verse, or the two halves of two different verses. I wasn't quite sure yet. In the warmth of your embrace I found acceptance, and I know our moments through all my adversities. In my darkest hour will save and anchor me, and I will kiss the orb that holds these memories. Velvet Remy sang the lyrics experimentally, smiling at how they came off her tongue this time. Much better, although I still think some of your other phrases are a little too specific. I shook my head. This is from me to her. It's personal. It should be specific. I knew I was being stubborn in the face of wisdom, but it was my song. And I rather liked the line, I've been crushed under the train car of loneliness. Velvet Remedy gave me a patient and charmingly understanding smile, and I knew she would manage to talk me into changing the line before the night was over. Well then. 
the storm continued to escalate. The winds blowing the rain sideways and tearing at Calamity hard enough that we were stopping every hour to give him rest. Even flying, our storm? progress had become achingly slow as Calamity continuously fought to correct our course as the wind blew us off path. I hated seeing him work so hard for us. The third time we landed, we were able to take shelter in the overhang of the remnants of a recharging station somewhere in the Holocaust blasted remains of a small business community which had once sprawled between Manhattan and Fetlock. I spotted the mostly intact storeroom in the otherwise collapsed building. On the other door was a faded and stained poster of a genial twilight sparkle. Knowledge is magic insisted the words above her friendly smile. In the smaller font beneath, the Ministry of Arcane Sciences is looking for a few bright minds. Together, we will save Equestria. Equally ancient graffiti scrawled across the poster. Partial words, something along the lines of fight the ministry, drove me to imagine the poster had been moved, the rest of the rebellious words left behind on a wall somewhere. Calamity unhitched himself and trotted into the supply room to give a good shake while the rest of us started digging through our supplies for the boxes of Pony Joe's donut holes and cans of sweet potatoes which would be our dinner. I eyed the boxes dubiously. I had overcome my squeamishness for eating 200 year old food, but I still planned to give the donut holes a pass. Calamity returned as Pyrolite was giving the cans a warming and slightly radioactive breath bath. He was looking less soaked and unsurprisingly more laden with scavenged goods. I still understand why you have I'm a radioactive bird around! Batteries while we're just sitting around here. Calamity announced as Velvet Remedy magically cleaned away the rest of the water from his fur and feathers. I don't want us losing him in the middle of this storm. Velvet Remedy gasped. Don't you dare. You've already worked hard enough today, and now you're finally dry. You will not immediately go wallowing around in the mud under this wagon. You rest. One of us will change them out for you. By necessity, that meant me. But I was more than happy to be volunteered. Well... Calamity looked thankful for the offer and the chance to rest his sore and aching wings. I figure maybe we ought to hunker down for a bit till the storm loses some of his range. We all readily agreed. I knew from experience that rain in the equestrian wasteland could last for several days, but I hoped the worst part would pass within a few hours. The burning white flash of nearby lightning turned the world into stark light and black shadow. Calamity looked over his shoulder and said something more but his words were drowned out by a peeling roar of thunder that shook bits of debris from the cracks in the overhang. Okay, guys, those of you who are watching, you guys who, who have all played Fallout or have seen, like, l gameplay of Fallout, you've all seen you've all seen the storms inside Fallout, which are entirely terrifying if you, have ne if no one, if you haven't seen it before. Let's say you are the lone survivor in Fallout 4 and you see these storms. You'd be fucking terrified. Uh, in this, I'm imagining those green clouds with the thunderous rain all and the wind blowing. I imagine those storms. And, and I didn't, in this world, it lasts for days. In Fallout, it's different because they only last like a few minutes. Well, in real time, but in the game, it's going to last a few hours. But seriously, uh, I, I didn't expect it to last for days in this universe. Yet again, Pegasi are not able to control the weather here. So, here we go. Minutes later, I squirmed underneath the Sky Bandit. The slosh sliding under my body wasn't exactly mud, but a gritty mixture of water and ashes. I tried not to think of who I might have been laying in. Surely most of the ash was from incinerated buildings, right? As I telekinetically removed the screws on the plate covering the spark battery array, I heard a familiar marching music leaking through the storm, an approaching sprite bot. The music grew louder as the radio drew near, the tinny quality of the music more than noticeable through the white noise of the rain. A burst of static killed the music. The sprite bot went silent. Hey, Watcher. Hey, little Pip. Been a while. Spike! And I can tell you've been busy. I laughed ruefully as I thought of just how much I've been through since I'd last spoken to Spike. So, how are things at your... house? I asked, an itch of paranoia preventing me from referencing the cave more directly. Are the, uh, unwanted house guests giving you any more trouble? 
Actually, they've been really quiet recently. I don't know if they're preoccupied or just avoiding the place. Changing topics. You haven't by any chance found any other... Well, others, have you? Wow. This conversation was awkward. No, not yet, but I'm looking. Thanks. We were either dancing around something, or we really had nothing to say to each other. I felt a resurgence of the pain caused by realizing that I was not the heroine that Spike had been looking for. I was not one of the ponies who could make everything right. For a brief, sparkling moment, I thought I knew my purpose, only to have that hope dashed against the cold rocks of an unforgiving reality. But then, the Gardens of Equestria wasn't going to make everything right with the wave of a hoof and a rainbow of good intentions. Even after it purges the taint from the world, the mutated monsters that taint has created will still be left behind. The alicorns, those things from the hospital, if any survived, bloat sprites, hellhounds. Even after it washes the tint from the air, the world will still be trapped under the depressing bleakness of the constant cloud cover. Even though it will rid the world of radiation, it will not exercise the evil that has festered in the hearts of so many ponies. Raiders and slavers will not disappear like the poisons of the soil. In short, there was so much more to do. And I didn't have to be destined to be something great, or important, or even vital. I just had to do something good for the Equestrian Wasteland. And if I could help a little towards something as great as the Gardens of Equestria, then that was just icing on the cake. The pause had stretched to uncomfortable lengths. Finally, Watcher said, Well, I guess I should be going then. Wait, I said, suddenly having a question. Can non-ponies ever be the bearers of the elements of harmony? Maybe I just needed to widen my search. Um, no, I don't think so. Oh. Well, it was worth asking, at least. I searched my mind for anything else to say. Finally, the star spawn in the room couldn't be avoided any longer. Spike, Watcher. I know what happened to Twilight Sparkle. Silence. Thunder rumbled in the background. Then... Oh? Spike was silent a little while longer before finally daring. Please tell me she went quickly, without pain. It was fast, wasn't it? A rock lodged in my throat. As I felt my ears paced back, I was thankful that I was beneath the Sky Bandit, the passenger wagon shielding him from my expression. I opened my muzzle, but I didn't have the breath to speak. I... I couldn't tell him. He didn't deserve that. She was his closest friend, a sister, mother, and best friend all in one, and the weight of this horror was too much. The pain of knowing now, and knowing that maybe some part of Twilight was wow. still in the goddess, alive but no longer herself, or even sane, and had been for centuries. I realized I was going to lie to Spike. Corrupted kindness, a pony's voice hissed in my mind. But this time it wasn't the voice of my little pony. It was the voice of the goddess. She died trying to save other ponies, Spike. It was a noble death. She died crying out a name. Was it his? And I believe she was thinking about you fondly as she passed. I think she was happy you weren't there. That you survived. It was an utter, bold-faced lie. Except my face was not bold and no pony would have believed me if they had been able to see me. No dragon, either, no matter how much he needed to. Another long pause followed. Thank you, little Pip. The mechanical voice of the sprite bot couldn't convey emotion, but I could still tell that hidden in his cave, the mighty dragon Spike was crying. Did you... find her body? Is she buried? I felt a hard pang try to tear apart my heart. After a moment of panic, I let out a shuddering breath. No, Spike. I saw her death on a recording. But after she was dead, the goddess ate her body. Utter quiet from the sprite bot, from Watcher, from Spike. I'm going to end the goddess, 
I said, and this time truth flowed in every word. And if, by a miracle, there's anything left to Twilight, I'll put her to rest. The fury of the storm beat upon the wasteland for most of the night, finally exhausting its rage and slipping back into an almost peaceful drizzle, like a snoring Yagwai. Well... I have to reflect on this. For one, I'm happy we got to talk to Spike again, since it's been a long time. But, second of all... Um... Corrupted kindness, the goddess said. That's what Little Pip is, corrupted kindness. Where she helps people with... She helps keep people happy and safe in the most crude ways, which is... She, which the goddess would say that's pretty true. Hate me in the comments if you want, but the goddess in a way is right about Little Pip. As much as she does good, you know, she still has to do a necessary evil. Even in this as small as a lie to protect a dragon from suffering at the sound of, of the concept of his caretaker's death. She spared him, she basically spared him the pain of knowing how Twilight died. I think that's something important to notice. Oh, well, anyway, enough of me rambling. Let's um, get back to the story. We reached Stable 29 in that foreboding hour of darkness whose name I could not remember. I gently told Pilate to stay behind and guard the Sky Bandit. Considering the plethora of monsters that we had encountered in Fetlock before, it was a reasonable precaution. But in truth, I just didn't want to bring a radioactive burden to the Outcasts' new home base. Outcasts, their Steel Ranger armor-bearing stripes of red, took battle stances at our approach. I saw them tense. A moment later, soft light erupted around us, and Velvet Remedy's satin voice rang out through the darkness. Hail, followers of Applejack. Little Pip and her entourage bid you welcome and request an audience with Steel Hooves. Hearing Velvet Remedy refer to us like that was uncomfortable. I didn't deserve that sort of credit or attention. But more than that, I didn't want my friends thinking of themselves that way. Still, as I watched the outcasts relax, I was thankful for her diplomacy. Two of the former Steel Rangers trotted over to us, flanking us as we were guided towards the door of Stable 29. I recalled with a shiver my last visit here. Since then, new scorch marks littered the walls of the maintenance tunnel. Bullet casings littered the floor, and dark stains told of the ferocious engagements between the outcasts and the Steel Rangers as they vied for control of the stable and the Crusader computer inside. One of our escorts motioned to another guard who stood at the control mechanism for the stable door. A cable ran from the guard's magically powered armor to the controls. She didn't even need to throw a switch. With a teeth hurting grind and a hydra like hiss, the huge gear shaped door was pulled open <coughs> on its internal arm. We marched forward. As I set hoof into the stable, part of me couldn't believe I was returning here. Oh. I remembered vividly the events and emotions of my previous excursion into this place. As yes. we walked, I was relieved to see that the outcasts had taken the time to clear the bodies away, and young knights were making headway on the rest of the detritus that littered the floors of the atrium. My first time here, I was bothered by the wrongness of the stable's layout. It did not conform to Stable 2, to the way a stable should be. Now, after my final visit to Stable 2, there was no such feeling. Seeing the death and destruction visited upon Stable 2 had strained its memory for me. There no longer was a proper stable. There had been fighting inside as well as out. One of the columns in the atrium, previously whole, was now smashed. The floor showed the sort of damage only a grenade would- I'm gonna say this right now, there is no proper stable. Though in this one it's stable tech, let's say vault tech, because we all know and Fallout, Vault Tech is completely fucked up. 
We all know the horrors that vault intended to begin with was to conduct brutal experiments. For example, they had a vault where every year they had to give up an overseer or to, as a sacrifice. The overseer had to be a sacrifice. But in the end, if they decided not to sacrifice their overseer, boom, they, sur- they, they get to go home. They open the vault doors. But in the... Which no one had figured that out. Everyone was too scared to find out because they, vault, Alt Tech was told them to prepare for the worst. They bas- told them to prepare for the worst because if they didn't give up a sacrifice, it would kill them all. That's what they were told. But they were too afraid... Of dying. So they did a sacrifice. Basically they went Mayan style on this. Um, And then there was another one. Uh, What was it? Where they basically turned the entire vault. Into a rehab center. Where basically. They took a bunch of addicts. Cleansed them of their addiction. And put them all in a rehab. Rehabilitative state rehabilitation. It's basic. Basically, the overseer became a counselor. That's all that happened, and then they decided to release a bunch of addic- addict addiction addictive drugs such as rage, uh, mentals. Uh, they had booze, all kinds of drugs, and everyone went nuts and killed each other. Just for the get, just to get a quick high. Voltex plans are completely fucked up. And guess what? They weren't. E- Voltex didn't even stay alive long enough to even find out any of this data. So, t- suits. Uh, basically, completely fucked up. Luckily, some of the vaults were smart enough not to go around. Though I don't know about Vault Alt Three. Because you never find out anything about Vault 3. Sorry, not Vault 3. Um, 101. You never find out anything about it other than the Overseer doesn't want anybody to leave. That's that. He, it was one of the good vaults. There are a few vaults that are probably a controlled group. Which is a plausible thing. That's my opinion of Vault 101. So, But we'll never find out. So, anyway. Let's get back to the story. Because she's back on the vaults. She's back in the one of the vaults she went to. So. Machine gun would cause. I spared a glance towards the clinic, shuddering a little as I remember the atrium guns pinning us in there. Those turrets were now replaced by models bearing the outcast colors and three apple symbol. I wondered what Applejack would have thought of her cutie mark on turrets facing into a stable. My gaze traveled to the gray tiled roof and down the catwalks that hugged the plain gray walls. Morosely, I thought, this room needs a mural. The two outcasts led us up the stairs to the second level. You had to say a mural. I glanced at the bulletin board as we passed. The old messages and notices had been cleared away. The board itself had been bleached clean. Its ghastly message written in pony blood existed now only in memories. The final resting place of vinyl scratch, the little pony in my head reminded me. The tomb of the original DJ pony. I quickly chose not to dwell on that. Down that path lay dark things. Oh yeah. We walked by a couple of knights, one hauling a this trash the cart, they found the other walking DJ behind Pony, her, the original. amiably. This place could really use some colorful posters, not to mention a few throw rugs, maybe some curtains. This place ain't exactly rich with windows, the other said pointedly, and I don't think Elder Steel Hooves is the sort to embrace draperies. I covered a snicker with a hoof. True, but he'd probably go for the idea of posters. Yeah, well, good luck finding one for us now. All the Ministry of Wartime Technology posters just say progress and have images of tech advancements. I've never seen one poster from them that featured their Ministry mayor. As we passed, I found myself thinking of the two mayors whose ministries never boasted their image, Applejack and Rarity. Hmm. One, because her ministry didn't want to give her the honor and the other because she did not wish to take the honor for herself. Steelhoofs, whose love for Applejack had never faltered, had a statuette of the mayor, Be Strong, in his shack. I suspected that was the best image of Applejack they would ever find. 
Instinctively, I had assumed Steelhoofs would have taken the Overmare's office. But as our escorts turned us into the security station, I remembered that Stable 29 didn't even have an Overmare's office. A ghostly touch of that sense of wrongness brushed the back of my mind. Steelhoofs was pacing the room, speaking to a brown mare with a cropped yellow mane whom I quickly gleaned was... X, Star Paladin Crossroads. She wasn't wearing Steel Ranger's armor, painted or otherwise. But then, they had to take it off sometime, didn't they? Except for Steelhoofs, of course. They've taken to calling him Elder now, I thought bemusedly as I watched our former companion. Can't send a full detachment with him, Steelhoofs was arguing. That would leave Stable 29 dangerously low on defenders. I did not yet know what this was about, but I recognized the dire necessity for the outcasts to keep Stable 29. If the Steel Rangers took the stable, then all the outcasts drawn here for refuge would be galloping into a trap. But if we send only a small honor guard, it invites an attack. Crossroads retorted evenly. We can't ask our ponies to walk into that kind of danger with insufficient numbers. Steelhoofs disagreed. They're Applejack's rangers. Galloping into danger for the sake of another is exactly what we should expect from them, and what they should expect from themselves. Any one of us should be willing to rush to the aid of an innocent without thought for ourselves, but there are no innocents to be saved here. This is a prisoner transfer in hostile territory. This is different, Crossroads insisted, and you know that. The outcasts flanking us stood silently at attention. I felt like I should clear my throat, to announce our presence at the least. Not out of any impatience, but to make sure the two leaders of this new faction were fully aware that their discussion was not private. I didn't feel like I was politely waiting. I felt like I was eavesdropping. If the Steel Rangers open fire on our paladins, then they risk catching their own elder in the crossfire. Steel has countered, but then seemed to have second thoughts about his own argument. Actually, if the Steel Rangers were to kill Elder Cottage Cheese in an attack, that might actually be better for us in the long run. Letting him go free is only going to borrow future trouble and death for the outcasts. Crossroads sighed and smiled reasonably. True, but we shouldn't allow ourselves to think that way. Remember, we're the good ponies. Steelhoofs nickered in response. Well, howdy, y'all. Calamity called out. Who you taking where now? I caught Velvet purring something under her breath. Our escorts bristled a bit at the audacity of Calamity's interruption, but as Steelhoofs and Crossroads turned to face us, Crossroads gave us a smile. And you must be Calamity, Velvet Remedy, that zebra, and, of course, Little Pip. For a moment, I glowered at Steelhoofs. That zebra? Really? But then Zenith spoke. Your reputation spreads, little one. And my indignation deflated. There was, after all, a fair touch of turnabout at play. I didn't believe for a moment that was why Steel had referred to Zenith that way. But if I spoke up, he could argue it was, and I could not win that argument. Velvet Remedy stepped forward and dipped her head in greeting. We are, and our zebra companion's name is Zenith. We are pleased to finally meet you, Crossroads. Hmm. Steelhoof seemed to look us over in lieu of a more familiar or formal reunion, then told Calamity. Elder Cottage Cheese of the Manhattan Steel Rangers is currently under house arrest. We have negotiated an agreement to return him to the Steel Rangers at Buckling Cross. Buckling Cross? I asked out of curiosity. Why don't they just come here to get him? Calamity wondered. Crossroads frowned. For the same reasons, I suspect that we are now disputing how many of our own to commit to the delivery. Elder Cottage Cheese devoted most of his knights and paladins to the assaults on Stables 2 and 29. The forces holding Buckling Cross are depleted enough to explain their refusal to divide their forces. Well then, in that case, y'all seem to have no worry about them attacking here. Them, no. Steel is paced. Others, yes. We can expect a counter-strike by forces sent from Philadelphia at any time. Their elder was killed in Stable 2. They will not forgive that. And they may receive reinforcements from other contingents. 
Crossroads shook her head. Huffington is still dark, and Trottingham is such a mess that the elder there will be hard pressed to devote serious forces to any place else. Unless the Steel Rangers abandon Trottingham entirely, Steel has pointed out. At this point, that might be their best strategic option. But even if they left now, it would be difficult for them to rally with the Philadelphia forces in enough time to attack before our ponies have returned. Hard, but not impossible. Calamity whinnied, whispering to Velvet. I almost want to tell him to get a room. I shook my head. But, you know, this be it. One of the security intercoms let out a burst of static, followed by a stallion's voice. Elder Steelhoof, sir. My apologies for the interruption, but Elder Cottage Cheese is demanding his medical chair. In the background, I could hear the grumpy yet cultured voice of a very elderly stallion. I'm still an elder, and you traitors will show proper respect. I will not be hauled back to my citadel in that capsule like a piece of luggage. I will return with my head held high. Medical chair? I asked. Steelhoof groaned. Crossroads trotted to the intercom switchboard, glancing briefly at the map of lights above to determine which button she needed to press to speak back to them. Velvet Remedy whinnied softly. Oh, Pip. I wasn't sure why she said it at first, but then I noticed which light was blinking on the map, and I realized that they were using the Pip Buck technician's stall in the maintenance wing as a jail. I stared as the brown mare found her button, the pony in my head trying to decide how I should feel about that. I dispassionately settled on. Makes sense. Well Elder then. Cottage, it's raining. Crossroads nickered politely into the intercom. You could catch a cold, which you know would probably kill you. Your life support capsule is the only way we can ensure you will survive the journey. You traitorous lot have already killed me, the Elder retorted. The Crusader mainframe in this stable was my last hope, and you've ripped that from me. Whether the finishing drop be from sword, drizzle, or cup of poison, I will face my end with dignity. Crossroads took her hoof off the intercom, looking at Steelhose with an expression of concern. Steelhose marched over, accessed the terminal, then pushed Crossroads out of the way as he pushed the intercom button. Elder Cottage Cheese, his voice rumbled into the intercom. This is Steelhose. This conversation is now being recorded. Please state your request again. Request? The elder responded with irritated civility. Yes. I require my medical chair be brought here at once, and that your knights here assist me in transferring to it. I will return to Buckling Cross as a pony, not a parcel. Crossroads shook her head. We can't. Chances are he'll die. Steelhose pressed the button again. You have been informed of the risk this poses to your health. If you refuse to travel in a life support chamber, you could expire. Is that what you want? Damn you, Steelhose, yes. Now bring me my goddess damn chair. Steelhose looked back at Crossroads and gave a grunt of satisfaction, hitting another button. Will some pony please bring Elder Cottage Cheese his goddess damned medical chair? Steelhoves? Crossroads gasped. I like what he's doing. But our armor and tomb companion had made his decision. He's an elder. He has the right and the authority to make his own decisions. The familiar Wait. voice of Night Strawberry Lemonade burst from the intercom. No, no. I'm on it. No, here's this. I'm going to say this. I know the reason why. I, I can feel it. I, I kind of can guess the reason why he's agreeing to it. Nor in a normal circumstance, if I wanted to ca truly keep him alive, yeah, I would force him in the fucking capsule. But in this case, he's giving him the option to choose the choose the chair, and a ch with the risk of dying, because Steel Hooves is probably secretly hoping that he'd die. Star Pout and Crossroads looked grimly displeased with her new elder's decision. Honestly, I don't think the assisted suicide of an enemy elder is the best stone we could have laid in our movement's foundation. More tenderly, do you believe Applejack would have approved? I could feel Steelhoof's glower radiating from behind his visor. His response was slow in coming. I don't know. This is not the sort of decision she would have ever wanted to make. 
but there will be many such difficult decisions over the next several months, and the survival of our faction has to take priority. He added solemnly, Applejack would want us to help the ponies of the equestrian wasteland however we could, and we can't do that if we're crushed before we can get our hooves under us. Little Pip, what brings you here? Steelhoofs asked once his discussion with Crossroads had ended and a few other interruptions had been attended to. I promised I would rejoin you, but as you can see, I have my hooves full. We need your advice, I told him. We have to go into the Canterlot ruins. We need to know what to expect, and how best to survive. Crossroads gasped. You're going where? Why? Steelhose was taken aback. Do you have a death wish, little Pip? Is it not enough to simply throw yourself against raiders? Why are you constantly driven to find new and more extreme ways to punish yourself, risking your life and often the lives of those who follow you? That hurt. I'd do this alone if I could, but we have to get to the Ministry of Awesome and Canterlot, and I can't do that by myself. Yeah, Calamity stomped. We appreciate you and not one to put us in danger, little Pip, but you can just cut that crap right now. You ain't pulling another one of your solo missions. Philadelphia was still fresh on every pony's mind. How bad is what we're trotting into? Velvet Remedy asked. Steelhose gave a low nicker. Bad. Not like it used to be, but still bad. Am I at least correct that you know where you're going and what you want to do? The Canterlot Ruins is not a place for sightseeing. I nodded. We have two objectives. Rarity's office in the Ministry of Image, and the Secure Vault in the Ministry of Awesome. Stilhos nodded. Good. You have that in your favor, then. Once you enter the ruins, do not let yourself get distracted. His visor turned to stare at each of us in turn, ending with calamity. Why? I asked, concerned that Steelhoof seemed to expect us to have trouble with that. Are there ponies still alive in the ruins who need our help? No. Steelhoof's tone was final. There is no pony in Canterlot who would meet your definition of alive, and no pony who is looking for rescue. Well, that's ominous. Velvet Remini whinnied. Zenith surprised me, saying, All those with the minds to leave Canterlot have long since fled. Those who remain are Canterlot ghouls, but not the manner of ghouls that have sound minds. These are empty shells filled with necromantic poison, retracing the last steps of their obliterated lives. Zombies performing rote tasks over and over because that is all they can remember to do. The zebra frowned deeply. Other than to attack, that is the only thing they all seem capable of, and they will move to slaughter any living thing whose presence they sense. Anything that is not one of them. Can't a lot zombies? Velvet intoned. Huh, lovely. Your biggest threat is the pink cloud, Steelhoves informed us. It seeps into everything, corrupting, decaying, killing all it touches. Over the centuries, the cloud has thinned to a mere haze. Canterlot itself absorbed most of it like a sponge, and now it bleeds from the walls and the streets, slowly releasing as they decay. I nodded. This much I'd heard before. These days, it is possible to survive if you are fast and careful. Some ponies can even survive hours of exposure at a time. But taking that risk is foolish. Do not fall asleep. You will never wake up. Limit your exposure. Every second you remained outside, the cloud is seeping into your lungs and your skin. Interiors are safer, intact buildings and tunnels, but only where the pink cloud has yet to penetrate. Why does pink cloud you sound like taint? You want to every healing potion you can lay your hooves on and drink them regularly. Their healing magic can reverse the effects of the cloud before it causes permanent damage. Do not use healing bandages. They can cause... other problems. There will also be pockets where the pink cloud has settled and pooled. Avoid them if you can. Dash through them with all haste if you cannot. While still only a fraction of the potency of the original cloud, such pockets will kill you in seconds. 
Velvet Remedy raised a hoof. Other problems? Steelhoof sighed. I have told you why I cannot leave my armor. You do not want to be wearing anything when you enter the Canterlot ruins. No protective gear is a guard against the Pink Cloud. And there is a chance that anything touching your coat may fuse to your skin under prolonged and extreme exposure. Little Pip, you will want to carry every pony's weapons telekinetically. The rest of you, take hold of those weapons only when you're using them. Pack lightly. Save for medical potions, as Little Pip will be floating your saddlebags. I was tempted to tell him that weight didn't matter, but realized that there might be wisdom in having less objects floating about me to keep track of. If and there ain't no ponies there to save, why are you so worried about us getting distracted? Canada don't seem like the sort of place to poke around in. Because Little Pip is fatally curious, Steelhoof said flatly, and you are a kleptomaniac. Scavenger. Calamity corrected with a flap of his wings. Steelhoofs ignored him. Well then. The Canterlot ruins suffered wrong. only the single strike. I heard rumors in the days after the apocalypse that after the shield fell, the zebras launched mega spells to finally obliterate the city. But if that is true, then those missiles never reached their destination. Canterlot is surprisingly well preserved. At least within those places the pink cloud has not yet touched. The city contains a wealth of treasures from the world before. In such a place, is it even possible for you two not to get distracted? Zenith turned to Velvet Remedy. It would seem the task falls to us to keep our two companions safe from themselves. There is more, Steel has warned. The pink cloud has seeped into everything it touched, and the decay has transformed once benign objects into lethal traps. The most noteworthy of these are the broadcasters and the sprite bots. Broadcasters? I asked. You mean like the pit buck peripherals like the one Blackwing gave me? The magically armored ghoul nodded. They were all the rage amongst Canterlot's elite just before the end. Pit bucks had become the latest fashion accessory, and the broadcasters were rare enough that having one was prestigious. Steelhoofs gave a dry, humorless laugh. Now the pink cloud has both weakened and decayed their signals. I cannot explain how, but the static that they now emit has a necromantic component. If you find yourself within the range of their effect, you must either destroy them or flee immediately. You do not wish to know how you will die if you do not. You've got to be kidding me, I gasped. The dangers of the Canterlot ruins had galloped past deadly and into outright insane. Is there anything similar to this? How was I going to get Fallout? every pony through this alive? I wish I was, Steelhoofs grumbled. If you're going there, then I should accompany you. You'll need more than advice. You'll need a guide. Some pony who knows the streets and can get you where you need to be swiftly. I breathed a heavy sigh of relief. That means a lot. Thank you. We really need you this time. And we miss you too, Velvet Remedy purred. Silo stomped and nickered. And maybe we can help you in return, I offered. You don't need to commit any of your outcasts to delivering Elder Cottage Cheese to... Where was it? Buckland Cross, Calamity answered with a grin. Lil Pip's right. We got me and we got the Sky Bandit. We can make the trip ourselves in half a day. Crossroads, who'd remained mostly silent during our reunion, spoke up. A splendid idea, but as much as we appreciate your offer, we cannot have you do it alone. There will need to be representatives of Applejack's Rangers present for the exchange. Steelhoof seemed to consider this. No, there only needs to be one, so long as that representative is appropriately high-ranking. Was it just my imagination, or did he sound ever so slightly happy? I shall go. Steelhoofs was with us again. The little pony in my head gave a small squee. We were together once more. Yes, Steelhoof is back! The door slid open, and I stepped out into the hall. Steelhoof's close to my side. Alarms went off everywhere. Wait, what? I stumbled, looking around. We're under attack. 
Steel was spun on his hooves and pushed back into the security station. And shit Start already hit the fan. Start Report. I don't know, sir. Crossroads said, zipping between monitors and panels of flashing lights. Perimeter secure. No hostile contact at the entrance. The outcast star pallet and paused. Oh, damn. The attack came from inside. I'm reading explosions in the maintenance wing. Ugh. Cottage cheese. Steelers growled. He threw himself to the intercom switchboard. Pony's report. What's going on down there? No answer. Cross. Bring up the tags of every pony in stable 29. And tell me we have the tag for Cottage's damned chair. My friends and I had re-entered the security station and stood watching as a glowing map of the stable began to light up with tag markers. I knew this procedure, although I had never witnessed it before. All pit bucks had a tag that allowed their wares to be located. This was how the Overmare had intended to find Velvet Remedy, and why Velvet had tricked me into removing her pit buck. Steel Ranger armor was built with nearly the same technology. It made sense that they would have similar tracking devices. But what about every pony not wearing their armor? like crossroads. The stable map was flooded with tags now, but two stood out, because two were in the section of the stable that, according to the map, didn't exist. The empty space where the Overmare's office was supposed to be. One of those two tags flashed red. That's the Elder's chair, Cross stated. Where? I knew. The Crusader mainframe. I didn't know how he managed to get inside a room that not even Shadowhorn had access to. But then, I knew I shouldn't be surprised. Elder Condish Cheese had clearly been in tight communication with Elder Blueberry Saber, and that Elder Citadel had been in the headquarters of Stable Tech itself. They had full schematics of all the stables. It would be easy for them to know things about each stable that the residents themselves did not. What the hell is he trying to do? Calamity neighed. He don't have the book all y'all been fussing about, does he? Uploading himself into that machine ain't gonna save him. No, Steeles replied. Cottage keeps sending rangers into the Canterlot ruins after that thing, but none of them have ever returned. However, I'm not sure he cares at this point. Even if it won't be him, Crossroads suggested, he may still view it as some sort of living legacy. The intercom burst with static. Elder Steelhoofs! A pony's voice breathed. Elder Cottage has escaped. I can see that, Steele retorted. How? His chair. Lockbox held Matrix disruption grenades. Steele stomped. Didn't any pony check the chair for weapons before giving it to the damned enemy? Sir, it was an Elder's private lockbox came the reply, and it was locked. Crossroads whinnied. You can't expect them to just abandon the respect that had been ingrained in them for decades. I would have had a hard time breaking into the Elder's private possessions. Mm. This world needs more little pips, Steelhoves groused. Velvet Remedy piped up, looking up at the map. Who's in there with him? Star Paladin Crossroads turned to a terminal and scanned it. Looking back to us, the brown coat of mayor replied, It's Night Strawberry Lemonade. Steel has reared. Crossroads continued to scan the terminal. Her armor spell matrix has crashed. She's paralyzed. The Elder has a hostage. I crouched against the wall between the security station and the two VIP rooms. Of course, it'd go that far. belonging to Shadowhorn and Vinyl Scratch, respectively, I recalled. A security panel lay next to my hooves. I had my pit buck plugged into the junction terminal hidden beneath it. On my pit buck, I could see into the room from a camera whose visuals were only available to some pony connected into this junction. Not even the security station had access to it. I saw the Crusader mainframe. A giant pillar with arms that reached out to smaller mainframes along the walls like spokes from a wheel. I could see Knight Strawberry Lemonade lying immobilized in her dead armor. Her helmet was off, revealing a very cute youthful mare. Her coat was pink, her mane a gentle yellow. Her palette struck me as a reversal of Fluttershy's, although her mane was cropped very short. Better for one who constantly wears a metal helmet. 
Hmm. She was glowering at the ancient wrinkled pony with a sickly oatmeal coat, sitting in a high-tech wheelchair. According to Steelhoes, the chair had been reclaimed by the elder from a crumbling Ministry of Peace hospital, along with several egg-shaped life support chambers and a variety of other advanced medical gear. Tubes continuously fed the decrepit body of the elder, a body kept alive only by extremes of medical science and a tenacious force of will. The elder was fussing with a helmet covered in gems and lights, attached to what I could safely assume was the Crusader mainframe's brain transfer mapping unit. The unit was meant to be worn on the head of a pony resting in a gel tank beneath it. Cottage was being delayed by the inability to physically remove himself from the chair to the tank, so he was unfastening the helmet. As I watched, he floated it free. The helmet levitated through the air towards his head, then stopped as it reached the length of the several vital cables that still bound it to the rest of the machine. The elder started jockeying his chair, trying to move close enough for his head to reach the helmet. It occurred to me suddenly that Elder Cottage Cheese was the first. No, second unicorn I had seen amongst the Steel Rangers. Their helmets weren't exactly designed for horns. I wondered if he had cut his own horn off to wear their armor. It would certainly have been a sign of dedication to the Steel Rangers. But if so, then the horn had regrown, and I hadn't thought that could happen. If so, it was a bright spot of news for Silverbell's future. Or, I realized he may have just moved up through the ranks of non-armored Steel Rangers. They did, after all, have unicorns like the one whose body I had found at Old Olne. Scribes, I think they were called. Researchers. I knew Steelhose was working to find a way into the room. Cottage would certainly try to use strawberry lemonade as a hostage. But knowing Steelhose, that wouldn't stop him. Fortunately, I had another idea. Hello, Elder Cottage Cheese, I said, speaking into the terminal. I'm Little Pip. I fact into the room to beg you not to do this. The Elder frowned but ignored me, trying to nudge his chair into a better position next to the tank. Stop him, Strawberry Lemonade cried out. Do whatever you have to do. Gas the room. Shut up, the Elder said almost amiably. Then, addressing me, he announced, Any attempts to interfere will cost this young traitor her life. I'm not a damsel in distress, the young knight bit back. I am a knight of the Applejack's Rangers, and I won't be your leverage. I'd self-destruct if I could stop you. First, I felt a warm pride stretching out towards Strawberry Lemonade. Hmm. You tell him, girl. Then I blinked. Nothing I'd ever seen had suggested that Steel Ranger armor could do that. But then, I supposed it would depend on the payload of their battle saddles. But you can do nothing, the Elder replied coolly. So cease your prattling. This won't save you, I told Cottage through the terminal, trying to be reasonable. You have to know that. The mind you create in the Crusader won't actually be you. I'm well aware of that, the Elder replied. I am not an ignorant tribal. He tilted and strained his neck, attempting to get the helmet to reach. He was getting closer, but there were still several inches of space between the helmet and a few remaining wisps of his mane. Then why? I asked plaintively as my pip buck scanned the junction terminal. My body and soul may not survive, but my mind will go on. This rebellion will fail, and when the Steel Rangers reclaim this place, my intellect will be there to guide them into the future. What future? I countered. All you ponies do is raid and hoard technology. Other ponies are building a new world, and you're hiding in your citadels. How much guidance does that take? Ugh. You are an ignorant insect, he grunted in annoyance as he shifted painfully in his chair. You cannot be expected to understand. Then educate me, I offered, my voice a little more curt than I would have liked. Educate yourself, he replied. Look around you, if you have the eyes and the wits to comprehend your surroundings. These tribals have no future. These tribals have no future. What you see as progress is just a brief distraction along their march to destruction. More ponies choose to be raiders and bandits and slavers than seem to flock to the dying embers of civilization. Only Red Eye has any real ambition towards creating a new world. 
and you have seen the depths of depravity he has fallen to in his attempts to manifest his vision. At least Red Eye is actually doing something. All he is doing is stabbing a poison dagger through the heart of Ponykind. Cod has shifted further, straining his neck in a way that caused him to quiver and grit his teeth in pain. But he managed to get the helmet onto his head. Do you truly think any society that evolves from the pits of misery he has created can be anything other than a degenerate and vicious abomination? I cringed, fearing that he might be right. But what about the Steel Rangers? What possible good could come out of the murderous thugs you've cultured? We do not pretend that we are building a society now. Elder Cottage Cheese informed me. We're just gathering what is necessary for those who will. The Steel Rangers will wait out this plague. And when you <coughs> based creatures who have no right to call yourselves <coughs> ponies have finally extinguished each other, generations from now, the Steel Rangers will emerge into a clean world. We will rise like a phoenix from the ashes. Not the twisted blasphemy of a balefire phoenix, but a pure, true one, bringing with us all the glory and knowledge of the past to create a new world of proper ponies. And what? You will guide them? Yes. He grunted, starting up the scans for the mental transfer mapping. You will rule them. Indeed. And what will keep you from becoming a tyrant? For that matter, what will keep you from making the same mistakes as old Equestria? All you're doing is preserving the knowledge and science they had when they fell. Nothing you are saving will prevent ponies from falling again. The device began to hum. The gems on the helmet began to glow. The lights began to flash. I will, the Elder claimed confidently. My intellect, my judgment. Unfettered by emotion and the selfish desires that have brought ruin to the ponies of past and present. It is in retrospect better that I never did acquire that book. I'll be wiser this way. You would be worthless, I mused sadly. Lacking in compassion. Lacking in any of the virtues that make us ponies worth saving. It's the virtue of our hearts that make us something good. That can make us something great. The elder started with alarm. Wait, what are you doing? Stopping you, I told him gently. The vice president of Stable Tech gave Shadowhorn the codes to shut down this crusader completely if it should ever pose a threat. I should have used them before. I'm doing so now. What? No! I'm truly sorry, Mr. Cottage. But there is no place in this wasteland for a cold, ever-living despot who would rule the world through a soulless vision. I sent the code. The lights of Stable 29 went dark. Wow. This went out to be a small... This chapter turned into something, like, it started to escalate real quickly. Like, you know, it started, you know, mostly conversations, you know, about past, present, advice here and there. But then it escalated to this. I don't know what just happened. I don't know. Actually, I do know what happened, but it just shit hit the fan. And I entirely forgot about the kill code. Well, at least it was put into good use. Well, anyway, guys, I hope you guys enjoyed this awesome episode of Fallout Equestria, and I hope to see you guys in the next. Um, I, as I said before, I will be doing these chapters more frequently, because the, this series is pretty long, and I don't want to keep you guys waiting too long for another, for another episode. So, anyway, I'll catch you guys later, and stay nerdy, my friends. Bye!